Women in leadership, women in business is so crucially important. And we're going to have a very interesting discussion about women in leadership and women in business. Joan Cool, welcome to CXO Talk. Tell us about your work and the things you do. I wrote three books, the two most recent, Misunderstood Millennial Talent, that was really based on global research about what early career professionals wanted and what they lacked in their careers. The most recent, Dig Your Heels In, Navigate Corporate BS and Build a Company You Deserve, is really about empowering and emboldening women. And we'll share more about what inspired me to do that. I'm really delighted that you're here. And I'm also delighted by our second guest, Michelle Carnahan, who is a top executive at Sanofi, the very large pharmaceutical company. And Michelle, welcome to CXO Talk. Thank you, Michael. I'm um, thrilled to be here with both you and uh, Joan today. I've been in uh, the pharmaceutical world for 26 years, so I guess one could say after Joan's book, I've really dug my heels in. Um, but I've, I've held a variety of roles in uh, sales and marketing and uh, kind of the operations world, HR, finance, you name it. Um, I've kind of been there uh, in the pharma world. I spent probably the, the first 25 years of my career at one company and I've been at the last 18 months here at Sanofi as their U.S. head of primary care and their U.S. country council chair. So I am uh, thrilled to be here today and, and talk with you about uh, this incredibly important topic. So uh, Joan and I both look forward to it. All right, let's start. Joan, tell us about your book. I think that's a good place to begin. What is the primary theme of the book? And why did you decide to write it? Let's begin there. So I always begin with saying I'm a champion for advancing women in the workplace and also girls' leadership. I have spent decades uh, as a volunteer and serving on boards for organizations in particular that serve girls, Girl Scouts, Girls Hope, Step Up for Women, um, Girls on the Run, and, and now I sit on the board of Girls Inc. of New York City. I'm also the mother of two daughters. So this topic of helping women rise and thrive as well as really increasing the confidence, the opportunities, and the potential for our uh, girls and their future is, is extremely important to me. So um, the book itself, I felt like right now in modern times, there is a lot of glamorizing this message to women that to get what you want, you have to job hop or you have to quit and do your own thing. And while there, those are amazing pathways and they work for some women, I felt like there was a lack of resources to tell the woman who is working for someone else in, in really in large corporations that we need you and that you aren't getting everything that you deserve, whether it's pay or opportunity or flexibility or relationships. And so really not just inspiring her, but arming her with the tools and strategies to start to transform the workplace. That is the goal of the book. Tell us about the, the perspective. What's the, what's the unique perspective that, that you present? I think that the conversation around women's rights, specifically in the corporate space, um, can sometimes fall in this category of this is the nice thing to do, this is the right thing to do. It's the smartest thing to do. This is really important for business, and we have you know enough research to prove that diversity fuels innovation, employee engagement, and otherwise. Um, so that's why I spent a lot of time to help women also know the data. That's why uh, the, this book is really um, you know, a playbook to feel grounded in the statistics that back up what we're saying here. And that gives some women confidence and men too to be champions of this. You know, second is how do you make it happen? So this is a big topic, equality, equity in the workplace. And so as an individual, really understanding what levers of influence you have whether you have a title or not. So that, that's also very unique about um, the time I wanted to spend there. And then finally, um, the last part of this book is making work worth it, which I love Michelle's stories in the book about this. Women all over the world have written me um, saying that her advice has transformed their thinking because we've got to enjoy this ride. This is going to take courage and endurance. And, and so that's every part of life, professionally and personally, and really helping women have some hacks uh, to, to thrive. Michelle, so you were at a company for 25 years before you shifted over to your, to your current role. I was, I was. How does your experience line up with the kinds of themes that Joan has explored in her book? 
Look, I think that my experience lines up really remarkably well to what Joan talks about, but I, I want to go back to a little bit too around why I think Joan's book is so needed today and maybe why it lines up so well to the experience. I think Joan's book does four things really well that fit the book to the business world we live in today. And the first is she sets up the need for women in top companies across the world. Number one, when a board has at least three women directors um, that make up their board of directors, um, they do 15% better. They return 15% better. Um, they do 22% better in terms of retention of top female talent. And they have a three times better engagement level with their employees. So it really does make a difference when you bring women and not just one, the studies are there now to say at least three to boards. And finally, when you bring women to boards, you have more female CEO CEOs. So first I think she sets up the business need. This isn't a nice thing to do. It's not be doing right. It's a business imperative and I think she sets that up. Secondly, I think she gives a playbook and it's one thing to talk about an issue. It's another thing to say, here's what you can go do. And so the pieces of, you know, have a plan, have a backup plan, know where you're going. I mean, we'll talk more about those as our time with you goes on, Michael, but those are super important and she sets those up in the book. The third thing that I think is really helpful as you think about um, these changes is be ready to disrupt a little bit. I don't think that either of us are gonna sit here today and say, this is an easy thing, but what makes it fun is the disruption. And then the thing I think her book touches on a little bit, but maybe this is a second book idea, but, but maybe the fourth thing that it only touches on just a bit is, I think there are lots of paths, but the exciting thing about being part of a big company is really what an impact that you can have when you break through. And that's why I really encourage people not only to get into these career paths, but to stick it out and to, to dig your hills in. So I think the book really sets out where we are today and how we can master where we wanna go moving forward. Fantastic. We have an interesting question from Twitter. And Sal Rasa asks, he says, considering the extensive work that you have both accomplished advising people about careers, what advice do you have for older workers in areas like healthcare, but it could be any place, any field. I think that that question is, was part of the inspiration for the work that I wanted to do in writing this book. You know, what I didn't say earlier is that I launched a company called Why Millennials Matter because of this passion I had for really investing in the next generation and their leadership potential. Um, and what happened was, as I worked with, again, some of the biggest companies on college campuses across the country, and top business schools, they realized what millennials want is what women deserve and still didn't have access to. You know, the flexibility and the meaningful relationships, constant learning and development, and transparency about what their opportunities are. And so um, as I started to interview and lead focus groups and run these research projects, talking to women at every level, early career, all the way through the boardroom, I realized that the women that were at the very top, they were still, they still had a need to feel fulfilled, to feel appreciated, garner that respect, that trust, and have access to these things. And so we need her to thrive for the next generation to even find it appealing to walk in the door at these big companies, um, let alone you know want to stay and make a difference. And so that's why it actually is really, it's not about just focusing on the next generation. We need the people right now, women and men, at every seat of the table to care about this issue and to realize it doesn't just benefit women. It benefits everyone. It's proven to increase you know, not just engagement and retention, but the types of benefits of companies that have gender diverse leadership, it's, it's fr friendly to families, it's friendly to humans. You know, I, I think it's one of those, those things that we just, we've proven it in research, we just need more people to embrace it and prioritize it. I am one of those older working people, so I guess I would say I think about this, um, I think about this every morning in the shower, so you're, you're getting some, some real feedback here. Um, you know, I, there are three things I always try to think about as, as how does this apply 
um, when, when you're working and you have some experience in the field. I think the first thing is, is make your experience count, right? And make that experience count in a way that it not only works for the betterment of the company, but it works for the betterment of the people of the company. And, and like, um, really like wear that experience with a badge of honor. That's the first thing. And, and how are you using that experience like a badge of honor every day? The second thing is we are never too old or experienced or even smart to learn. And so the second thing is, is wherever you are, you deserve to learn too. You deserve to be developed too. Take that wherever you are. And the third piece is, I think what a little time and experience gives us um, is just a real appreciation for life and understanding um, really what the big decisions are, what the big mistakes are, and they're not always what you think they are in the moment. And I think having people and, and helping those who aren't experienced, really knowing where the focus goes and where the commitment goes. I think that no matter how smart you are, there is a piece that only time gives you in that. And so those are the three things that, that I try to do, but I also try to take. I mean, I make sure that my experience is rewarded and I also make sure that I have a company that wants me to learn too. Um, and so I think those are important things to take. And I think that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. What are some of the mechanisms that women in particular can use to find opportunity? One of the things that struck me about Joan's book is very often we hear advice if you for women and men. If you want to find opportunity, you need to get a new job, go to a different company. But your advice is a little bit counterintuitive. You're saying, hey, you can find opportunity where you are. And so tell us about that please. Exactly. And, and this is really what inspired the movement that I have about having the courage to stay and staying to lead, which is that there is a lot of noise that tells you to go after more money and bigger title. And I can promise you, you probably can get that elsewhere. But there isn't enough time spent on what you're leaving behind. Who knows that company the best? You do. The politics, the processes, the people, um, how power is distributed. And so literally, um, the idea of helping women embrace and, and really evaluate this big decision, should I stay or should I go? And I find that women are facing that decision far more often than men because of the bias that's built into a system and you know a culture that wasn't designed for us hundreds of years ago. Um, so, I mean, that's all, that's important. And just even some basics, the number one key here is about finding an opportunity is relationships, relationships, relationships. That's why chapter seven, I wrote the entire chapter about them and there isn't even enough space because I think really strengthening your peer allies, having those mentors and sponsors, being a mentor yourself, making sure that you are spending the time allowing people to know what you really want. I always say that who you know, it can open doors but how well they know you, that gives you the opportunities because they need to understand what it is that you want. And some of us aren't even really clear on what that is because we haven't even been in a position to evaluate um, what we deserve. Um, so that's really, I think, the, the, the opportunity and a lot of the steps within the book when I talk about how she can make the case and make the decision. It's very personal, digging your heels in and staying at your company. I never say that this is universal because in some situations, women may say enough is enough. But in others, they haven't really figured out that they could be a catalyst for change. I think Joan had a great answer there. I'll add a couple of nuggets up front and then I'll add my own personal story because it kind of fits here. My two nuggets up front, I think to always remember, um, the, the first one is in regard to opportunity, I would say the biggest learnings I've had over 26 years is have the courage to ask for the opportunity and then have the courage to embrace it. So as we're thinking about opportunity, I think that's the one thing that we often miss is, are we asking truly for what we want? And then when we get it, do we fully embrace it? So that's kind of the first nugget I would give. Um, the second nugget I would give kind of follows along kind of where Joan has been. There are gonna be challenges everywhere. So often, those challenges are worth taking on because of the catalyst you really can be in a company where you have equity. 
the one time I will tell people to always leave, and only you know this, is when your company's integrity and ethics doesn't line up to your own. And so those are kind of the two overall pieces of opportunity, when to leave, when to stay, that I would add to, to what Joan had. The personal anecdote I'd like to share, Michael, is just my own, because I stayed at the same place for 25 years. And some might ask, like, why in the world after 25 years, A, why did you stay so long? And then B, like, why did you finally decide to, to change? Like, what was that about? And, you know, to me, it was more than just the job. I'll, I'll start with first why I stayed. It was a company of people I loved, and they just kept giving me interesting job after interesting job after interesting job. And that's what drove me. Um, it also had to do with a dual career husband. It had to do with where my extended family was located. So these things are never in a microcosm of just a job. It had to do with a lot of things. Um, but then I got to a point where the next job was an interesting job, but maybe it wasn't quite as interesting as some of the others had been. Personally, it worked for the right time for my husband's job to move. And what I felt like was I'd lived in the same place for 10 years. I was getting a little bit less interesting and it was personal as well as professional for me. Um, and what's great about the decision and making it is it wasn't running from something, it was running to something. And I have to say with the exception of one day, and there was this one day, I've always been happy I did it. And it's not because I love the place I am so much more than where I was. It was that where I was fit me when I was there and where I am really is helping to build new skills in me professionally as well as personally. And I'm a big believer that we're not just one big blob personally and one big blob professionally. It all kind of goes together. So for me, it's a balance across. Um, and I think what I love about building long careers is you do get to meet people, build a tribe, but what's been fun with me starting over is meeting new people and building that in a new place. It's different, but you get that opportunity again. So I think you know it when it's time. I think you have to have a very good personal barometer to say, what's the growth I want and where do I want it? Joan, recently I had a similar conversation with the chief marketing officer of SAP. One of the things that Alicia, and that's Alicia Tillman, she's the CMO of SAP. So one of the things that she said is exactly what Michelle just said. She said, you know, women don't ask for what they want. And other business leaders, other female business leaders have, have made the same comment to me. So given, given this common thread, what's going on with that and what what can women do to to not I don't I was gonna say is it a trap to not fall into that trap or to overcome that obstacle? I'm not even sure what the right terminology is. So when I am really training women, working with women at at various levels in various industries, um, talking to them about the the derailers, what can derail her career? What I found in research and what I know from her stories and the journey I went on um, to write this book is. There's two things happening. There are barriers that are internal, that you know are self-limiting, that are I still don't think they're our fault, that are built and influence our confidence um, and really our impression of what is possible because of the bias we've experienced. So there's things, barriers that are internal, but then there's a lot of major barriers that are external. That's why we say this isn't all on her shoulders. We have to actually change the system, the culture, the behaviors around us. Um, so, and actually the data does show that women do negotiate as much as men. It's that things like the likability bias, um, the fact that as men advance and are more assertive in their leadership, that they're liked more by women and men. When women advance, are assertive, showcase their ambition, they're liked less by both men and women. So a lot of that, again, stems back to how we believe we should see women behaving and um, you know, be more about more devoted and communal and team oriented versus, you know, men being kind of like this bearer of responsibility. 
Um, so that's why, you know, in the book, chapter four, I spent all this time talking about those internal barriers, overcoming imposter syndrome, syndrome um, things like, you know, believing that it should be this, this meritocratic system where I just put my head down, I do my work, the results, everything's going to pay off. And that doesn't, that's not how things work, you know, for women. We need to have relationships. Um, so there's those things, but again, there is external pressures, and that's why looking at your talent management process, your recruitment process, um, your succession management planning, your benefits, there are real systems and processes that have bias within them but haven't really been disrupted for a long enough time that, that would benefit women. Michelle, this is, this is kind of a dumb question because I know the answer, but uh, have you run into this, these kinds of issues that Alicia Tillman was describing and that, that Joan was just describing? Absolutely. It's kind of, of, of course, you know the answer because you talk to a lot of women in, in, podca in podcasts like these. You know, I have, and I bet I can guess your next question. So how do you deal with them is probably the next question. How do you deal with them? Exactly. <laughs> That's what I thought. You know, I think over the, over the course of my career, a couple of different ways. I mean, first I'll, I'll start with how did I personally deal with them? Um, you know, the, the first way is I think you, you have to have a support network, right? A support network is so important. And to me, that comes in three different ways. I encourage everybody to find a partner. And I don't care if that partner is your life partner, if it's your best friend, if it's your sister, if it's your mom, you know, find that partner who's the right partner for you who can help you with all the other stuff. Um, and then I think my second tip is find um, both an emotional and an intellectual supporter. So I say everybody needs that emotional supporter. I always talk about for me, it's, it's my husband. It is that person who, even if you are wrong, will say, oh, but honey, I think you were so right. Um, because sometimes you just need people to, to, to make you feel better, emotional support. But you need intellectual supporters too, who will actually say, no, you were wrong, but maybe you should think about it this other way. So you need that. Um, and then the final piece I would say is this whole thing about as women finding your tribe. And I think really having those people around you who not only can support you when it comes to finding the job or looking for the job or thinking about the next uh, promotion, but can make the right connections for you and can help you think through things in the right way. And, and I think about that often as I made this big jump to, to um, a new company after 25 years. It was really my tribe. I had a son who was going into high school. And so, you know, as a mom, what did I think? Oh my gosh, can I do this to my son in high school? And, you know, it was people who said, you know what, he'll survive. Um, when I was negotiating salary, it was a good friend of mine who understand comp who said, no, no, Michelle, you have to ask for more here. Here's what you have to look, look for. Um, it was that tribe that supported me. So personally, those are the things you have to do. Really think about your support system. Understand how you use that. And then as I've moved on further in my career as a, as a woman executive, I, I think we have to think of about what are the three things we start to change um, in, in the world of business. And the first is, how do we create more line leaders in, in positions of leadership throughout our companies? You know, one of the things I talked about was putting women on boards and what a difference that made. I mean, if you put women on boards, three or more, you're likely to more likely to have a female CEO. Um, you know, women in these positions just think about this more often. And whether you're a first line manager or whether you're a CEO of a company, we have to start thinking about that more broadly. The second is the talent management piece that Joan talked about. You know, what is bias in our system? Do we really have secession management that works? What does that look like? Are we meeting the needs of our employees? Do we know what the root cause is? So that's the second thing we work, um, we work through. And then as I think, as we think about kind of the big picture of where we're going over time, how do we create a language that just really thinks about the worker in 2020 is different than the worker employee in 2000. 
and has our workplace caught up with that? And I think women are sometimes on the cutting edge of helping us get there. And are we building that throughout our organization? So I think I've dealt with it personally, and now I think a lot about how do I deal with it as a leader within an organization. I want to just back up um, a couple of things that Michelle said, which are always brilliant, which is what gives me so much energy is um, her stories like those she just shared are in the book. Um, but what she talked about, about women on boards and CEOs, uh, just this past week, another female was named CEO in the Fortune 500, which was uh, Hayward Donegan, the CEO of Rite Aid. So that brings us to a record number of 36 women holding the position of CEO at, at the same time in Fortune 500 companies. That equates to like 6%. It's not enough. And But again, this is happening. We're seeing this rise happen while more Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 boards are, are having an increase of women representation. But in, at the same time, you see the, the IPOs that were announced just in 2019 from January to, aug to August, about 100 of them, 40% of them had all male boards. And so we need to stop and think about, like, this is why this is a business case. It's not changing as fast as, as it should. Um, and that's why you have to have really business policies and leaders that are championing in it and investing in it in, in big ways. Um, so just wanted to add that. And, and, and just the piece about relationships, I'd love if we went there a little bit more and talk about what, what women need there. Well, Joan, I think just where VC money is going, right? Yes. I mean, that whole piece of... Melinda Gates has a big part of it in her book, right? Yes. I mean, where Great VC book. money is going. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I think, so what's interesting is, uh, actually, Melinda Gates has a great video out right now that's hilarious. It's meant to bring some humor to a topic that is really bringing us a lot of grief, but she has comedians talking about gender bias, so Google that and check that out. Um, the relationship piece, because that's why we stick together. And, and actually, that is the thing, how lucky I feel to write a book like this and continue to build relationships with women. I often discover that women, um, either by happenstance um, or through crisis, um, realize that they need more women in their corner. Women need to support each other, and we should feel and have permission to ask for help when we need it. I think right now, you know, we've been talking about having mentors and sponsors. There's a lot of, of information and guidance out there, um, but women need peer allies. You need women that are sounding boards, as Michelle was talking about, to work through those decisions. And I love that advice about the emotional and intellectual partners. Um, but I have found when I look, when I talk to women in finance and healthcare, even in sports, that it lines up with a study I just read that was said that for 77% of highly successful, high achieving women, women with MBAs, um, that they had surrounded themselves with a tight knit group of women, about two to three women. These aren't best friends. These aren't, you know, the person they get to see very often, but they're women that bring a diverse network to the table and they believe in each other professionally. And they know that they can call each other when they need that energy, that endurance, that validation of you're not crazy, you're not being emotional. Yeah, you do deserve that. Or like Michelle said, maybe they're in that situation, you could have gone about it differently. Here's your style and here's something that we could work on. Um, I think the more that we have that transparency with each other in the workplace, even talking about what our pay is, what our bonus was, interviewing women in wealth management, um, you can read in my Forbes column the number of women I've, I've read in that talk to in that space that say women don't talk about money with each other in the way that men do. Maybe they use it in more of like a braggadocious way, but I can tell you that on college campuses, you know, a lot of the young men I even talk to are like posting their job offers on Facebook and women are, you know, scared to talk about it. Yet right now I'm seeing at the top MBA schools, women on average getting higher offers because A, there's less of them in MBA programs which we need to increase, but also companies are valuing them. So we should talk about the fact that, you know, this is what we deserve and this is what our income potential is, and that helps you have more confidence to negotiate if you aren't there. My biggest sponsor in my entire career was a man. I mean, it was a man who uh, promoted me to my first VP position, and this was the same man. It was a man who got me my first retention bonus. I mean, it was the, it was a, it was the same man who said to me when I took that VP job, because I was like, I don't know, could I do it? Because it says it needs these three qualifications and I only have two. And he actually said to me over a lunch, like, Michelle, you're the only person who doesn't think that you can do this job. So, you know, get with the rest of us. So I think that, you know, that's not to say that there isn't a place for men in this. There is 100%. 
But there are some things that as you look to build relationships and some of these natural relationships that can happen with women, what I sometimes see even women doing as they get into some of these relationships with, as we have more and more executive women, they become even better at then having the compensation relationships with some of the men, et cetera, because they just get better at the conversations, right? So what happens on a golf course on a Saturday afternoon where maybe we in the past haven't been invited, but we've created that at our own cocktail party, then suddenly it's not weird for us to be talking about compensation because we've done it in habitats where we are comfortable before. So I think ultimately what we don't wanna have is there's the, the women's conversation and then there's the men's conversation. But what we wanna do is I think we want to build in women the ability to be able to have these conversations anywhere and to really float in and out of them so that we are actively involved in where the conversations happen. What are the characteristics or, or are there characteristics of certain companies that women can identify as being, yeah, there's opportunity here in this place or no way and I need to jump ship? What about that? I think how I would uh, approach that question is what I've seen and experienced. So on, on college campuses, let's say the, the MBA programs, um, I can tell you that, that women and men who are also champions of this cause, they're going to your website, they're going to the about page, and they're seeing if you're walking the walk. Um, you can say and throw all these amazing things at them and say, this is this great place, we value you and inclusivity. and. Um, you know, every the flexibility and integrating work and personal life. But when they click that about page and it's an all male board and they don't see themselves, they don't believe that it's going to, if it hasn't gotten there in the past 30 to 100 years, it's not going to get there. Um, so that's the first thing is that they're really seeing and judging. And 86% of millennial women are choosing a company that has gender diverse leadership or choosing not to go there. They're making big decisions um, based on that. When you're inside a company, you know, I think that it's this idea of really reflecting on if you, you know what's happening around you, what your experiences are, where you think the hangups are, where are the kinks in the chain here. I mean, she has to. To I, I think I think the successful formula is having leaders that are inclusive, obviously, but they're resonant, and resonant means that they really spend time helping people understand that they're not replaceable, that they have true alignment, and there's some meaning to their contribution to the bottom line of the business. And so that's being a resident leader. Um, and third is a courageous leader. So a courageous leader, nobody gets this type of topic right and perfect, but courageous leaders ask the questions and they allow these conversations to happen. One of, one of my favorite moments this year since launching Dig Your Heels In, I was leading a workshop um, at Major League Baseball for men and women. And it was a really hands-on workshop where I wanted to talk to them about the lay of the land, you know, the data and what it shows, but I actually wanted them to work on specific scenarios where bias exists. So let's say they were working on, one team's working on, um, had the fact that men interrupt women three times more often than other men, and women can't get in a, a word edgewise. Um, or another situation where they're working on the fact that from a talent management or looking at you know, promotions, women are judged on um, their behaviors and their communication style versus their real business impact and results. So by giving them the data, telling them why it happens, telling them why that it matters, and then letting them feel safe to talk about it and telling them up front, hey, you, you can ask whatever question you want. This is a safe environment. You didn't cause this. This started hundreds of years ago, but you are the problem if you don't change it moving forward. I got such tremendous response from the men emailing me afterwards, talking about afterwards that they felt like, okay, I, I heard that thing about interrupting, man interruption, or mansplaining when men explain an, or say an idea after a woman said it 10 minutes later and get the credit. They're like, I heard of that, but I didn't understand. Like, so that happened once, it ha it's happened to me. But for women, it's like 10,000 paper cuts. It's happening over and over again and the consequences are graver. So that's the thing I think is is helping everyone understand that there are, there are things that you can do each and every day to improve the day-to-day -day experience that start to move the needle in these bigger ways. Michelle, let me ask you something quickly because we're going to soon run out of time and there's a whole bunch of things I want to ask you about. So again, I'm holding up uh, Joan's book, which is titled Dig Your Heels In, and the subtitle is 
navigate corporate BS and build the company you deserve. And so, Michelle, how can women, I think this applies to men as well, but how can women identify the corporate BS so that they do not fall prey to it? And I think Joan alluded to it a bit, but you're, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty easy to identify. That's what's unfortunate. So I think it's all around you and you can identify it. And um, I think one of the hard things is like, am I, am I dreaming this? So, you know, no, I mean, people do repeat each other a lot. They do speak over each other. I mean, all of those things are real. Um, the hard part is what do you do about it? And so, you know, I would take that to say the answer really is encourage, I believe. And it's having the courage to speak up. It's having the courage to behave differently, you know, and it's having the courage to really stick with it when it's hard. You know, Michael, you and I have talked before and, and you talk a lot about business turnarounds. And I don't know that I see a business turnaround and, and career work really different. Anything really tough in life um, requires two things, I think, courage and grit. Um, you have to have the courage to say, this is gonna be tough, I'm gonna fall down, I'm gonna have to get back up. Some people are not gonna wanna um, you know, associate with me after I do it. It's gonna be a much more difficult path than walking the straight line, but I wanna do it because I can make it better on the other side. And some of the corporate um, some of the corporate games and some of the other pieces in organizations, that's the kind of commitment they require. But you can really leave a mark on an organization. And I think people, um, you know, people want to get to the great things that organizations really do. Um, in the case of what I do, we make medicines. That's why we came here. Um, in the case of what tech companies do, they make great technology. And so I think having the courage and grit to change those things is, is why I stay. And I think, you know, it's the reason to dig your hills in. So two things, you know, the first thing about politics is that it is always gonna be there. It's probably not gonna go away because it is um, a result of working in a dynamic, complex environment with different people making decisions and having to influence one another. So what I tell women is, because this is the thing that ekes them out, it disgusts them, it's why sometimes they look up to the next level and they say, oh, I don't want to be up there, I don't want to behave like that, I'm fine right here. The, the problem is, you know, number one, you have to be aware of it, but you don't have to lower your standards or your values or play into it. I've been teaching women how to become cultural anthropologists. You need to study how power is distributed in your company. You need to be aware of how decisions are made. And you can do that by observing meetings. You can observe that by um, you know, watching how different leaders respond and what they recognize, what they reward. So being educated on it and also sharing that education with others around you and but talking about it openly helps everybody have more transparency. So I think that's the first thing is because um, I think that that really, really gets in the way of women going after more influential and more visible positions. Um, the other thing is that navigating conflict and tension, I believe um, that women sometimes struggle with this because we weren't given the permission, the skills, or the knowledge growing up to really handle conflict because of the stereotypes around good girls and how we were supposed to behave. and. Uh, you know, be nice and, but not too nice or we're a pushover and, you know, be devoted, put everything, including our company before ourselves um, and don't get too emotional. We should let things go. And, and being a good girl at work means, you know, not, it means taking on the office housework, you know, taking the notes, doing all the things that you don't actually get rewarded for in performance management at the end of the day. You may be good at it and it may fall on your plate, but it shouldn't be your responsibility. It's being um, in a room, a client enters and he addresses the, the, the man at the table when you're the one in charge. Um, or it's just the fact that sometimes you feel like you have to shrink yourself or not assert yourself in the way that you want to because someone in the room is speaking louder than you or being more aggressive towards you. And so I, know, I study all these things, not only in women at all ages in the workforce, but in girls too. And so these seeds are planted very early about how, you know, again, girls and women can navigate situations that give us tension. But here's the issue. As a leader, you cannot avoid tension. 
you have to handle conflict. 20% of managers deal with the um, you know, conflict every day within their job. And what I found is that 64% of women are facing these microaggressions. You were saying like, when do we identify corporate bias? Bi BS? It's happening every day. It's being talked to in a condescending way. It's the fact that women are twice as likely to be seen as somebody at a junior level than men. It's all these things. And so the, the idea of, like Michelle said, having courage and grit to speak up when it's happening First, it takes women to know that, again, you're not alone in this. One in five women are alone, the onlys, in a room on a team. There's still not enough of us representation-wise. But two, these things are happening, and somebody may not be a bad person. They may just be completely unaware. That's why I think the unconscious bias training is pretty rampant in corporate right now. Um, so, I mean, that's just the thing that I think is important is for women to really study and understand the culture and look at it a little bit more in an objectionable way so that they don't take themselves out of the game. So I think the one piece of advice I would give, whether it's dealing with corporate BS or whether it's staying or it's how to choose a company, choose a company, choose to stay if you can be 100% yourself. Because any minute you try to do something else that isn't yourself, you don't bring your best to work. And if you're not bringing your best, then why stay? And so to me, the biggest piece of advice is if you've made it this far, and I know it sounds like you know kindergarten advice, but maybe everything we did need to know, we learned there, I don't yes. know. But be yourself, 100%. And if it doesn't work someplace, it will work someplace else. And if you're managing people, find a way to let everyone bring 100% themselves. Because any minute, they're not doing that, it's, min it's minutes that isn't going to your business. We are out of time, but let me ask you one final question and I'll ask each of you just to answer very, very, very quickly. What advice do you have for men? For men, it's to be an ally. What I've learned from men since actually they're twice as, three times more uncomfortable mentoring women since Me Too and Time's Up, and that's bad news. We need men, we need you to be our partner, we need you to be our ally, we need you to be our mentor and our sponsor is you know, to feel comfortable talking about these things and that you, if you don't feel comfortable taking a woman to the same place you take a man that you're mentoring, a sporting event, a bar, don't do it with the male either. Find a place where you feel comfortable for both. So I think for men it's like recognize that this benefits you, that this doesn't work against you and that we really um, want you to talk to us about what you don't understand about our experiences. I'll go back to where I was earlier, be yourself and find ways to create um, opportunities for others in your organizations to be yourself. So if a basketball game is where you get great work done, um, believe it or not, some women love basketball too. And so I think that the more that we can bring our full selves to work, um, the more that I think we can all accomplish for our customers. Okay, it's a great show. We've been speaking with Joan Cool, who is the author of Dig Your Heels In. It's a very insightful and a very interesting book, as was this conversation. And we've also been speaking with Michelle Carnahan, who is a senior executive at Sanofi, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Thank you both very, very much for taking your time and sharing your insight and wisdom with us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for watching. Before you go, subscribe on YouTube and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website and subscribe to our mailing list. We have incredible shows coming up. Check out CXOTalk.com and keep joining us. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.